Welcome, everybody. Hey, thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of everyone at Center for Brain Health, my name is Stephen White. I'm the Executive Director at the Brain Performance Institute. And I just want to welcome all of you to our most popular and now widely viewed event that we have each year. It's the Brain and Owner's Guide, our February lecture series. And I just want to thank everyone on the call and from our prior series. This year, we have registered over 22,700 people for this event. So the fact that we've gone with a video-based, a remote-based version, we've been able to reach more people from across the world. So thanks to everybody. Tonight is our fourth and final uh, event in this series. And before we get started with Dr. Ramsey, I just want to tell the newcomers a little bit about who we are and what we do. The Center for Brain Health is a cognitive neuroscience research center here at the University of Texas at Dallas. And our singular focus for three decades has been on discovering and championing, championing a new approach to brain science. And the way I like to say it, because I'm, I'm not the scientist in the group, um, but we look for core research to discover new ways to keep healthy brains healthier longer. We take advantage of the cognitive neuroscience that started here at the University of Texas at Dallas and the Center for Brain Health that confirmed how plastic your brain is and how we can leverage that neuroplasticity to improve how we all think, work, and live. We have a core research, research center, which we call Brain Health. And that's our discovery center, if you will. That's where we actually explore and find new ways to leverage the brain's plasticity. We also have our own imaging center. We have our own two functional MRI units that are strictly devoted to research. And importantly, we also take the research off the shelf. And here at the Brain Performance Institute, we take that research and find ways to create scalable tools and strategies that can help everyone, regardless of age and regardless of your status. So that's our challenge, right? Is to take that research off the shelf and actually create ways to help mankind improve their brain health. All of this is now a reality because of a technology platform that we've developed here at the Center for Brain Health. We have an online brain health assessment tool we call the Brain Health Index. And now we have our focus on the Brain Health Project, which is a revolutionary research project that will eventually have, well, we're out well on our way, hundreds of thousands of participants. And we're gonna collaborate with researchers all over the world to test over a number of years how we can, how far and how fast we can improve brain health. The Brain Health Project is unique, it's innovative, and I wanna show you a short video so you can see what it's all about. We work, we live, we innovate and create. At the center of it all is your brain health. The ability to solve problems, think analytically, share empathy and thrive. We're trying to make brain performance really the next fitness revolution. So how do you boost brain power? Welcome to the Brain Health Project, an urgent call to transform your mind to work stronger and faster. This is an absolute crisis, as great as any we have ever faced. We have to equip the minds and brains of our citizens to cope with the accelerating, dizzying rate of change that they face in their lives. Your brain health is not fixed. Scientific discoveries prove it can adapt and grow regardless of your starting point. Our greatest value, the asset that will help us to change everything, every problem we're in, is all in our head. To harness that treasure, we must measure and monitor progress while things are going well versus waiting for an injury or disease to strike. Too many of us are outliving our brains, and that does not have to be the case. The information age is bombarding us with more content than our human brains can handle. How do you keep from getting lost in this and focus on deep thinking? For starters, stop multitasking. 
Science shows us that multitasking is bad for your brain. It reduces fluid intelligence, causes brain atrophy, and increases chronic stress. The global pandemic is creating more stress than ever. Stress that leads to depression and anxiety and beyond. Unlocking our potential to navigate these hurdles starts with learning the right strategies, even in school. So when teachers have these strategies, they're empowered to support our learners, and then the learners are now able to take ownership of their learning. Training kids how to think is doubling academic achievement among middle schoolers. I think the greatest national security threat is pre-K through 12. If we don't take care of educating our young men and women, then we have to ask ourselves, where, where are we going to be in 20 years? Our world-renowned scientists know you can increase your brain health, not lose it. It's time for a new category of health, brain health. You are a game changer. Ready to transform the world with us? Be a part of the brain health revolution. It starts here. You know, every time I see that, I'm inspired. Um, and it's absolutely true. Listen, we're a nonprofit, so we cannot do this. We can't hold this series. We can't do anything we, out, we do without the generous support of our sponsors and our donors. And I want to thank two tonight. First, I want to thank our founding uh, sponsors for the lecture series, the Container Store. And joining us tonight are Melissa Reif, the chairwoman at the Container Store and outgoing CEO, and welcome Satish Mohatra, who is the new incoming CEO. You've probably read about that in the Dallas Morning News. So thank you both. For 14 years, the Container Store has sponsored this series and, and look what it's become, over 22,000 registrants. So thank you. And also now a very, very special thank you to tonight's sponsor. And tonight's sponsor is Highland Capital Management. And importantly for us, a lot of our core work started with our warrior-centric programs. And warriors, right, are first responders, active duty military, veterans, veteran caregivers, veteran families. And here at the Brain Performance Institute, Highland, uh, Highland Capital Management has been absolutely critical for over a decade to help fund those programs. So joining us tonight is Lucy Bannon, who is their Director of PR and Communications. Lucy, if you'd like to say a few words, and again, thank you from everyone here at the Center. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, and thanks to everybody at the Center for Brain Health for bringing us tonight's event, um, which wraps up this, this really great lecture series. As we all know, this past year has uh, tested our, our collective mental and physical health, um, and everybody in Texas knows that the past week really tested us further. Um, but in all that time and through all those events, it's become clear how connected those two things are and how powerful some of the activities in your everyday life can be an influence in that connection. And so it's, it's taken a crisis for many of us to realize that. But, you know, as we all know, if you know the Center for Brain Health, they've long been exploring that connection through their work. Um, and so Highland Capital Management and Highland Capital Philanthropies um, is proud to support the Center for Brain Health as they really advance this field and been the pioneers in this field. Um, and we're ex especially excited to sponsor events like tonight, um, which help share this work to a much broader audience. And so thank you to everybody who's joining us virtually. Um, you're in for a treat. Um, and I'll make one more point about tonight's event. Um, while all the lectures in this series have been impressive, we were drawn to this topic in particular because it covers an area where we um, have some control, relatively speaking. So unlike say genetics, nutrition is something that you can directly and immediately influence. And that's really what um, led us to, uh, to support this event out of the, the great series that we've seen this, thus far this month. So we look forward to hearing from Dr. Drew Ramsey about exactly how to do that. And thank you, Dr. Ramsey, for joining us. And I'll pass it back to Steve uh, to properly introduce our speaker. Thank you, Lucy. And again, thanks to Highland Capital Management. Again, you've just been such a terrific sponsor over the years, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. So, you know, much like our other speakers, Dr. Ramsey, Dr. Drew Ramsey, his CV is too long to read, so I'm going to hit some highlights. We are honored to have him here tonight. Dr. Ramsey is a nutritional psychiatrist and a farmer. And I learned uh, from Dr. Ramsey that 
our brains consume 20% of everything we eat. So I'm not stealing any thunder from Dr. Ramsey because that was on his website. But listen, this is an emerging field. He is a leader in this field, a well-published author. He has a new book coming out on March 16th called Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety. Who wouldn't want to read that book? He has, uh, he's a founder of the Brain Food Clinic in New York City, which offers integrated clinical care and guidance for people with mental health concerns, relational difficulties, and food challenges. And importantly, what Dr. Ramsey does is it really aligns super well with our holistic approach to brain health. So we are going to learn a lot of things tonight. We're thrilled to have them. We are going to save about 15 minutes at the end for question and answer. So please use the Q&A. Again, the chat function is off. And please go to speaker view so you can get the best view. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you, Stephen. Hello, everyone. I, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and I'm going to share my slides with you. But it's really, it's just, first, I just want to start saying it's just an honor to be here. It's an honor to be speaking to so many of you. Um, I'm sorry I'm out of breath. I think a raccoon was just eating one of my chickens, which has never happened to me. But I, I, as, as Stephen mentioned, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you from my farm here in southern Indiana. So <clears throat> I'll catch my breath and deal with the emotional aftermath after our talk. But I'm really excited to be here with you now. And I wanted to thank uh, Lucy and Highland Capital for sponsoring the series, uh, to thank the Container Store just for supporting our um, all of our efforts to improve our communications and our education around all of the great new science that you heard about. And I'm really hoping today to and uh, tonight to, to share with you some of my work over the last decade and how this applies to a psychiatrist's office. I, uh, this is not my normal office. Now I'm an internet psychiatrist that happened to me suddenly. And, and that's been strange to be honest with you all. Um, because part of what we do as mental health professionals is sit with people with very, very personal things in a very quiet, well-curated space. And that's not what the internet feels like exactly, is it? And, and so um, in the midst of all those changes, I also see that we're really, um, for the first time, starting to uh, open up and talk about mental health in a way that um, I don't really think we ever have... All right. Yeah, well, welcome good. everybody to tonight, and tonight we're going to speak about how to feed your mental health. And as as uh, you've heard, some really important words I want to touch upon, specifically how food relates to this idea one of mental health and brain health, to uh, the new science of how uh, food relates to things like neuroplasticity and inflammation, and these buzzwords words that we hear in the healthcare space and in the wellness space but we don't always relate to our brain health. And then to what I really care about tonight and care about in terms of your health as a psychiatrist is your mental health, how, you, how your cognitive neuroscience and your neuroscience relates to how you feel, how you process anxiety, um, and most importantly, how you achieve the things that you love in life. Um, so to start out, and, and maybe this isn't a funny slide for 2020, because like people are like, you know, it could happen. Did you, were you around for 2020? Um, uh, but there is truth. You are what you eat. So these uh, dinosaurs are saying, of course, you feel great. These things are loaded with antidepressants. Very quickly, just because I'm a physician, my disclosures, I really don't, um, uh, I'm not sponsored by um, anybody other than the sponsors we mentioned tonight for tonight's um, event, but I'm on the editorial board of Medscape Psychiatry. I'm on the advisory board of Men's Health Magazine. I don't take any industry money other than that. I'm an author, so, um, and I'm not going to discuss any medications. And just to, I am a, a, a cookbook and diet book author. So I hope that means you'll listen tonight with uh, that little bit of skepticism. And I also wanted you to know just a little bit of where I'm from. Uh, Stephen mentioned generously, I'm, I'm a farm boy. I grew up in Indiana and then, and then uh, four years ago moved back with my family to our farm in Indiana and my commute was back and forth to New York. And so I've had this really um, blessed and wonderful experience of being both a rural uh, guy in America in the middle of Indiana, um, we're the poorest county in Indiana, and then also getting to uh, live and, and work and, and think in New York City and, and um, where there's just a, such a center of 
um, excitement around mental health and brain health. I mean, everybody in New York's always had a therapist. So it, it, it's really been an interesting contrast, especially over the last couple of decades, is mental health has become something, even before the pandemic, that was so important for us to think about and talk about. And then there's been this trend, right? As we've been thinking about food, and, and this, this is uh, uh, the Brooklyn Grange farm, and all of us now are thinking about farm to table. We're thinking about going to the farmer's market. We're trying to eat more greens or eat more plant forward or thinking about where our food comes from and the environmental impact of our food. And that's all kind of relatively new in the sense of how popular those notions have become and how we think about, uh, as Stephen mentioned, how ideology affects um, our biology or, or how our ideas around food affect um, how our brains function. Mental health is such an important part of it to consider. When we think about uh, brain health and cognitive health, we often think about dementia and Alzheimer's, and those are certainly very important illnesses to consider. And in many ways, our recommendations, I think, for brain health and food, um, you spoke with Dr. Lisa Moscone. Going after Lisa Moscone is intimidating. I just want you to know anybody who's at her talk. Um, she's an amazing colleague and friend and, and uh, Alzheimer's researcher. Um, but when you look at it, it, it loss in terms of um, uh, economics, uh, mental illness, and specifically depression, suicide, anxiety disorders, schizophrenia, they, they cost our world and our country uh, more than any other disorders. And that's because of the top causes of disability. And disability is a really important concept for us to understand from a public health perspective, because a disability is, is us not being our best selves, right? And, and whatever that is, we often think about how we have challenges or physical disabilities. Well, well, mental illnesses, for example, your ability to focus or concentrate or be creative, you know, that, that feeling you have when you're at your best self. Um, the numbers, I guess, don't matter so much to me as a psychiatrist, um, what matters to me is those other losses due to mental health disorders that I've, I've, I've um, seen the consequences of and sat with families and with parents and uh, with patients. And, and so it doesn't really matter to me how much it causes. I just think that anything we can do to, uh, for mental health disorders, that, that's a good fight to be in. And I'm glad tonight that you're with me to, to be in that fight together a little bit. I also, this statistic has become my least favorite statistic and it's unpopular, so I just want to explain why. I love mental health awareness. I, I love the fact that we're talking that 20% of us, 20% uh, of people struggle with their mental health in some way. It's just, I also think that's not true because I think everybody watching struggling with their mental health. And I just think we should say five out of five of us got the gift of a human brain. We did, and it's incredible, right? I mean, it's like, it's, it's a little fritzy sometimes, but it's mostly incredible. What it can do is incredible. You've got one. And five out of five of us should be taking care of it actively, not waiting until we have symptoms, not waiting until we're worried about dementia when you're my age and maybe, you know, you have a hard time figuring out screen share, screen share or you make a little slip screen instead of screens, right? Uh, that's not when we want to think about mental health and brain health. We want to do that from day one. We also know, and one of the reasons food is so important, we know that people don't seek out treatment that well for mental health disorders. This is shifting as we improve our efforts to educate the, everyone and, and to destigmatize mental health and mental health treatments. Like, hi, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm friendly and nice, and I will help you with anything that you're struggling with. That's, I think, not how people often think about getting um, some assistance and some partnership in terms of improving their mental health. More than half of kids don't ever get treatment. 60% of adults, if you look at men, it's over 80% don't seek mental health treatment. And then things, things that we've seen this other exciting trend, which is that we're thinking about how food relates to mental health. This was an article that some of the big guns of nutritional psychiatry in the research world, Felice Jack and her group, and a few of us who were early in this were, were quoted and started talking about, you know, what, what can you do uh, to eat for better mental health? And in case I get boring or you don't like my data slides, this is where, because people want to know what to eat, but I want you to see these up front because I want you to think about the evidence that I'm presenting to you over the next several slides in the next half an hour. And do these foods cut the mustard? Mustard's not on there, but do these foods stand up to that? Or is some version of this food a part of your dietary pattern? That's the really important takeaway. Not so much whether you think eggs are great or whether you think red beans are great, but are there... Um, 
what is your stance on animal products and how are they or not in your diet? What is your stance on beans and um, how do you understand the nutrients those bring and what's the version in your diet? So those are, those are my power players in my new book. And sorry, I am in book launch mode and I've got this new book coming out in a month, which is all about this. And I think I just also wanted to share, this has been everything I've been thinking about. I'm a general psychiatrist, but every patient I meet for the last decade, I've just asked them around what they eat and been curious how that influences and affects their mental health, how I can shape that um, for good based on the most recent evidence. So quickly, Stephen mentioned a little bit that your brain consumes 20% of your daily calories. So 20% of your energy, and you think about it, there's a little like three pound thing up here, right? When I get in the treadmill back when I'd go to the gym, I'd like run, I'd run, and I'd run. It took me a long time to burn 420 calories. It really did. So your brain, it's doing something amazing up there. It's mostly fat, which I just think surprises people. And, and it tells us something. It tells us something around how uh, some nutrients and how um, some of how we might want to think about brain care relates to fat. And then just quickly, PUFAs are polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's a category that contains things like omega-3 fats, uh, which um, the one DHA is a big structural fat in the brain, makes about eight ish percent of the dry weight of your brain. This one fat's the longest fat you eat. Um, and then cholesterol, just because cholesterol kind of has a bad name and a kind of, you know, it's like a bad word in food, like, ooh, don't eat cholesterol, no cholesterol. And we could debate that. We're not going to tonight. We could debate that a whole lot. But I just think it's interesting. There's a whole lot of cholesterol in your brain, a whole lot. And then some things that most people like, like, let's say, sex, right? Most people are, or vitamin D, two things. Pretty much universally, people are into vitamin D in, in the first one, right? The, those get made, sex hormones get made from cholesterol, vitamin D gets made. So it's just an interesting, just an interesting molecule. All right, nutritional psychiatry just to define that because there hasn't been a definition until pretty recently. It's the use of nutrition to optimize brain health and to treat and prevent mental health disorders. And, and this was really how I wanted to define it in terms of this is what it means to me and, 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 and what I hope to do with food and what I hope will happen this is, your, this is my wife, she joined CrossFit, so I took her arms and put them on a brain. Um, it, but the, the real the kind of premise is, do those power players, do these foods and food categories, right, dark chocolate and rainbow vegetables, do they give you a more stronger, more resilient brain? And when we're talking about resiliency, what I love talking at University of Texas, Dallas, is because of all of the work that's been done there in regards to neuroplasticity. When I finished medical school, they called us the doctor of the future. And that was like kind of not true because it was 2000. And even back then they were teaching us that you didn't actually grow new human brain cells. And now we know that that's not true. And, and it revolves around this uh, molecule brain derived neurotrophic factor. Although I'm sure there are a lot of researchers watching who maybe know a lot more about this than I do. But, but this is kind of for me as a clinician, you know, when you're a psychiatrist, everyone just like thinks about serotonin, right? But this is the most exciting brain molecule because BDNF brain-derived neurotrophic factor, uh, as many of you watching know, it does all these magical functions in the brain in terms of promoting neurogenesis, uh, the birth of new brain cells, uh, more uh, connectivity. One way I think about this with patients is, and we think about that classic phrase in biology, structure equals function that the function of our brain really it, it, it relates to the structure. Structure is one of connections. And that's really when we know a health brain is healthy is usually we've, we've got great connections. We've got really nice connections to serve ourself and our intention. We're connected to our community, to our loved ones. We're, we're connected to um, you know, our work. So, um, and one way that I like to think about these efforts in terms of um, more brain health prevention is can we get the brain into brain grow mode? And then just quickly to show that this isn't just also a, uh, this is a type of science that, that, that really supports the idea of, okay, so zinc, we know zinc lines up in a lot of ways. Um, populations that don't eat a high zinc diet or eat a low zinc diet have a, a higher in, uh, incidence of depression. We know that zinc relates to BDNF. And, and so there's a, there's a way that it kind of leads to me as a clinician of like, okay, how could I get um, patients eating a food that has more zinc in it? And one of the ideas behind that, and, and I would say this is in the has been tested and is hopeful phase, but I think it's going to be much more of how we begin to practice and think about mental health disorders is how do we get brains into this brain grow mode? This is one of the illustrations from my new book, Eat to Beat Depression and Anxiety, and just a really simple illustration, right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to eat these foods to promote growth and connectivity um, in the brain. 
Um, and we know that there's something between neuroplasticity and illnesses like depression, for example, some of the newest medications. What, what, how does ketamine or how, does, well, how do these new kind of class of medications work? They work mostly by inducing neuroplasticity. One of the wind, headwinds we face to this is neuroinflammation. This uh, uh, inflammation is, is, again, one of those words in medicine that we increasingly understands also affects the brain. Um, it, it, it's a whole kind of subject and focus of, uh, of my, my new book. And what struck me in the research was talking to some of the experts in this area and really beginning to understand, again, as, as Lucy mentioned, if we can think about living a lifestyle that decreases inflammation in our brains, and, and we know that we can, not right? Just imagine like you're living a life on super highly processed foods and lots of sugars and, and, and uh, you know, struggling metabolically versus you're eating lots and lots of nutrients that research indicates decrease inflammation and turns on genes that fight inflammation. And, and that's what I want my patients' brains kind of bathed in is that, that type of milieu. Lots of things cause inflammation. Poor diet is the one I really want to focus on, but just to acknowledge there's other stuff like microbiome problems, um, lack of physical activity, depression itself causes inflammation, smoking, sleep deprivation, right? It's it sort of, um, it feels like you're just describing 2020 here and I didn't like make any of those choices. Um, and then in terms of, I guess here, I just want to talk a couple of high level concepts as I want you thinking about those foods, which is how we're thinking about neuroplasticity how we're shifting in how we think about depression and anxiety and mental health disorders to, to not to throw everything out. Serotonin is important, psychotherapy is important, but to include ideas around inflammation. And then to think about what causes inflammation and what can we as clinicians and you as people do to fight that. And then of course the microbiome, because you just can't talk about brain health in 2021 without talking about the microbiome. These are all the bugs in your gut. In case you haven't been paying attention to the brain health world at all, this is your first talk. The microbiome is just fast. It's sometimes called the second brain, but it's just this really new, exciting set of concepts and pieces of research that the types of bacteria in your gut regulate. There was a question I had on Instagram of, of how this relates to, to energy. If you think about the microbiome as regulating inflammation, as regulating energy metabolism, and it really is something that you, it's like having a zoo. And what you feed the zoo, you know, if you have a zoo of like all the animals, right, you're going to have like a whole lot of different foods, right? A zookeeper, there's a lot of food by a lot of different animals. If, if you're just feeding uh, all of your animals meat, you're going to end up with a lion zoo. And that's fine. I mean, you saw how that worked. All right. I'm going to start burning through slides. So we have time for questions, but let's just say food changed a whole lot in the last hundred years. And here are a few of the ways, which is we started processing foods. We started getting most of our calories, the majority of calories American eats are for added fats and added sugars, right? We started really refining carbs. We got rid of animal fats and started eating lots and lots of both um, uh, polyunsaturated uh, uh, vegetable fats in the form of, of trans fats and margarines and lards. Um, and in doing this, we really shifted from a very omega-3 focused type of diet, and especially as brains were evolving, there was a lot of omega-3s and minerality in that nutritional milieu. And started eating more of these omega-6 fats and seed oils. There's, there's some debate in this, but it's interesting to see that when you look at, for example, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fats, it, it relates to teen and adolescent depression, uh, highly correlates to teen and adolescent depression. And then we added all this stuff uh, to our diets. There's this big debate about like lab grown food and new foods. And I'm just, you know, I think it's probably because I grew up a little bit on a farm, which is like, I, I'm not sure that modern food is going to solve some of what modern food has caused. And, and I'm just a little suspicious as we've put food dyes and preservatives and trans fats and, and, and kind of hijacked the human brain in a certain way. Cause our brains love, we love color. We love crunch. We love salt. We love, you know, it, it's, it's a very, detailed science of how our brains have really been taken over by processed food. And in doing that, we're not getting the nutrients we need, which is fascinating, right? Because everyone's taking a multivitamin for insurance. And so one of the reasons I wanted to show those foods at the beginning is that really how I think about your mental health and how I want you to maybe think about taking activity and protecting your mental health is how you can get all of your nutrients from food, how you can get a lot of BDNF, not from the latest, newest fangled superfood or supplement or, or even medication, uh, but really through activities in your daily life. All of my hope, I guess, tonight is to really empower you to start taking steps. 
Now, just to bang on modern food for a little while, we just started eating different stuff, right? And I'm just like, I'm a doctor. It's like something happened. Like, so what brought you to the ER tonight? And it's like, so what happened in the last hundred years? And just like, wow, we eat a lot of soybean, a thousand fold increase in soybean oil. And I'm not trying to say soybean oil is like the evil. It's pretty evil, but it's not the evil. I'm just sort of trying to say, wow, this, this is a big shift in the ratio of the fats that we eat. It's a little suspicious to me. The paleolithic diets are about one to 10 in the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fats. And, and this is just human fat tissue and sample. And it's just, you know, I guess it's just an observation I wanna share with you. We've changed the fat, brain is made of fat. We've changed the types of fats we've eaten. We're now changing the types of fats that we're made up of. And that has physiological consequences. Now, to shift gears to the data about nutritional psychiatry before I run out of time so I can take all of your questions, um, let's just quickly go through what are some of the emerging pieces of science. I, I was told that you all are a, a pretty brain savvy audience and so I wanna share the science. And again, for you to assess that in your own. So many people have your ear or want you about what you should eat, how you should eat. Um, and I really am a psychiatrist. I really want you to eat. I want you to eat foods you love and I want you to feel really like good about your stance and your plan. This is some of the data that I think should maybe influence when you're thinking about things like your mood. This looks at the Mediterranean uh, diet. It is a study of 10,000 university students. It's epidemiological studies, uh, which you can, people have criticisms of because it's looking for correlations. We always confuse these for causation. But I like this one because it looks at a lot of university students. That's when anxiety and depression tend to really hit it follows them for four and a half years and it runs a number of different statistical models looking at various things that can complicate the data. What they find in the system sort of over here is that the people who are like the best half of eating the Mediterranean diet, they have a significant reduction in the risk of depression. There's a pretty kind of linear trend here. No matter how they slice the data up, they find good statistical significance. So University students who ate more like a Mediterranean diet got less depressed between let's say 30 and 50% of the time, uh, there's a lower uh, risk. 30. Uh, when you look at these types of epidemiological studies, kind of line them all up, uh, again, you just see that there's a lower risk for a more traditional style diets. And, and the, the decreased risk, again, not amazing, about 19%, but it's pretty consistent. There's also good correlation between how diet pattern affects your overall brain size. Again, when we begin to think from a neuroplasticity standpoint, we begin to think that people with depression and dementia tend to have kind of shrinking brains um, uh, or smaller brains. Here's just very quickly looking at, at a good diet, right? You have a, a nice uh, big brain. Um, uh, you see that the brain really shrinks. These are individuals uh, between the ages of 60 and 65. And again, just a really important time for us to get active is the brain begins about my age in your mid forties begins to atrophy. And so one of the ways to think about this work in nutritional psychiatry is how can we make changes to have more joyfulness, more brain food, more activity, kind of keep our brains robust. So let's move into the real rubber hits the road data where we begin to test this. The first study is totally an accident. These researchers, um, Charles Reynolds and, and, and Sarah Stahl and their group are, uh, they've got a nice study where they're looking at elderly depression using a problem-based solving psychotherapy and they need a control group. And so they get lots of nutrition handouts and they say, well, that? Like, well that'll be our control group for the study. There's not a lot of hours in this, right? Uh, elderly individuals with depression just got about five and a half hours of individual counseling over two years. That's just like a couple of hours a year, right? Not much. And they were just not even talked about like my favorite brain foods. It wasn't like blueberries and dark chocolate and like how to make amazing kale Caesar salads. It was um, government handouts of, of meal planning and budgets and eating more plants. And uh, what they found is folks stuck with the study. And then there was a reduction in depression symptoms of about 40%. And so, uh, and, and what's interesting is, is that, that those lasted. Um, this is then followed up with the first randomized uh, controlled trial. 
And, and this, of course, is the gold standard of medicine, uh, the SMILES trial by Felice Jacka, Michael Burke, really they're superstars in, in this world. The SMILES style uh, study is, um, which um, uh, followed individuals 12 weeks, individual sessions uh, with a nutrition counselor, 67 individuals. And again, what they find for the first time ever, this is the first ever utilization of food to treat clinical depression in a trial. And, and this was 2017, so just four years ago. 33% of the patients go into full remission, right, control, compared with their control, just 8%, leading to a number needed to treat a 4.1. So for those of you who are in clinical practice, when you think about an antidepressant, or those of you who are interested in this, uh, and you look at like an SSRI, like Zoloft added on, uh, right now, augmentation strategy would be to add on something like a atypical antipsychotic, like aripiprazole. The number needed to treat of aripiprazole added on to SSRI is about 10, and it costs, let's say, 500 to $1,000 a month. If this study would hold true and be replicated, you're getting a number needed to treat of four, and these individuals in the study, they saved $140 a month because they started cooking more at home and eating more um, whole foods, plants, seafood, nuts and legumes. So to get FDA approved as a medication to treat depression or any mental illness, you need two good quality randomized trials. So here's the second one for Mediterranean style diet. This is a, a larger trial, like almost a little more than twice as large, 152 patients in this. Um, Mediterranean style cooking workshop that would totally work for my depression. It's like, what are you doing tonight, Drew? It's like, oh, you know, it's Tuesday. I've just got my <clears throat> Mediterranean style cooking class. Me and all my friends are just like getting together, tasting a little olive oil. Going to talk about our feelings. We're going to take a little. Uh, so, I, I, I guess I'm joking. I'm kind of being serious. That would be lovely, right? So, uh, depression scores improved by 45 percent in the Mediterranean diet group. Here's what the data looks like. You know, not the biggest spread, but there's statistical significance, and these changes are sustained at six months. So, these first trials prove a couple of things. One, in a mental health setting, you can talk about nutrition and affect change, because in both of these studies, the individuals really affected change in their diet and that was carefully measured. And then that seems to affect depression. So how, how does this work? And, and also, uh, by the way, and I go over this in the book, in the SMILES trial, uh, they, they also had significant findings with anxiety. There was significant reduction in anxiety as well. That didn't really get emphasized so much in the reporting of the data and, and, and all the kind of media around the study. Um, how does it work? There are a lot of ways we think this works. And, and I think that one of the ways, again, to expand how we think about mental health. Let's stop thinking about just chemicals in the brain. There's a lot of like debate around chemical imbalance, whether it's a real thing or not. Let's just agree there's a lot of chemicals in the brain <laughs> and there's a nutritional milieu that they've lived in and there's some headwinds that those molecules are facing. And these are some of the ones that I think influence how this works. Now, this slide, I really love. This talks about two things that are important. First, remember earlier I said depression, you know, there's a little chicken in the egg argument. Does, do you have more inflammation in your brain because you're depressed, you, you, your genes are jiggered a little towards depression or you've had a bad trauma or, right? Or when you're depressed, do you have more inflammation? And, and it's where the chicken and the egg kind of logic doesn't really apply to brain health very well. Because we know when we give people interleukins, for example, hepatitis, there's a treatment where we give IV interleukin for hepatitis C. And 50% of those patients get frank, severe depression to the point that on the treatment protocol, you pre-medicate them with Zoloft or another antidepressant. So we know interleukins cause depression. We also know patients with depression have more interleukins. So it, it, it's gonna be a really fascinating area where we think, okay, what do these interleukins represent? They represent our infl inflammatory system, which is regulated by the microbiome and in part by the food we eat. But just quickly to unpack this slide, this is looking over um, uh, six years of looking at the change in interleukin-6, which is a, a marker for inflammation. And what you see here is that, first of all, depressed patients just have more interleukin. But when you compare the kind of, you know, non-healthy diet versus a healthy diet, you see that there's this protective effect for the Mediterranean diet. And maybe one of the ways it does this is by buffering inflammation. So then quickly, I just want to talk a little bit about our clinical work. Um, the Brain Food Clinic is it's our very small clinic in, 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 we used to be in New York. Now we're just on the internet. Uh, but 
our work, we're a general psychiatry, mental health, or integrated mental health clinic. I just make sure that everybody gets some assessment in terms of food and that we incorporate food into our treatment planning. What we want patients to understand is what is brain food, that some foods have more nutrient density. That means you get more things that we know are important for the brain, like omega-3 fats, B vitamins, complete protein, magnesium, zinc. It's like, I don't know, it's 2021. I don't think we need to debate that anymore. And, and instead of looking to all the various kind of, I don't know, formulations and ways people try to get that into folks, I just wonder, and I think the data supports at this point, doing that with traditional food seems to really help. Uh, uh, another idea is for us to focus and help patients focus on dietary patterns and food categories is how we prescribe food. So you're not focused on something like kale, but more leafy greens. And, and how can we frame this around neuroplasticity? Not to freak people out like you ate pizza last night, you shrank your brain, game over, but more to inspire people that there's a way to always improve the in nutrient density of your diet. Talking with patients and asking them about food as a psychiatrist, I got these answers in New York, like I count calories, I don't eat cholesterol or fat. People look at me and wink, like no red meat doctor, don't worry. And then they give me the other wink and they'd be like, but every night I drink two glasses of red wine to protect my brain. Like that's the nutritional psychiatry plan for most people. So like, I drink red wine for my brain. And I think everybody watching, you can do better than that. You're allowed to enjoy your red wine, but like, I don't really think that's a brain food. I don't think that's like in the top 50 brain foods. I mean, and I like red wine. I just, let's really be serious about what brain food is. I, smartphones came out when I was a doctor. There's like big, and, and it was amazing. And I thought, wow. Uh, and, and so this was one of the early patients whose diet I assessed. And this is what he was eating. He had a severe depression. And just think like, is this the food that's going to help get him better? Right? Think about what do you see? The major molecule you see here are carbohydrates, right? Simple carbohydrates, lots of strange fats, food dyes. I always tell patients eat the rainbow. He's like, doc, I'm eating the gummy bear rainbow. Not the gummy bear rainbow. Rainbows are very important. We'll talk about those in a minute, right? We can come up with a set of our favorite brain nutrients. We went into the literature and, and, and that's what we did. And, and it's my colleague, Laura LaChance and I were thinking, how do we share all this nutritional psychiatry data with our colleagues and create like a protocol or something? There was this sort of idea of like, well, how are we going to tell them which foods we picked and how do you translate the Mediterranean diet? And wow, there are all these, what are called nutrient profiling systems and none of them had ever focused on brain health or mental health. And so we looked at what nutrients were most correlated with depression and had evidence that could be uh, used to help treat depression. And then we said, what foods have the most of those 12 nutrients per calorie? And the antidepressant food scale is what this was called. And, and don't leave this thinking you need to just eat oysters and watercress. That's not the point. The point of this is to create food categories. Look at the top 10. What do you see here? You see leafy greens and you see some peppers, rainbow vegetables, you see herbs. Right, look at these top animal foods. What do you see? Well, it's fascinating. The top five, you see mussels, clams, and oysters. You see organ meats, right? Are those in your diet? And there's, there's reasons because uh, that those are at the top. There's, there's such concentrated sources of things like omega-3 fats, B12, iodine, um, the, these 12 nutrients that are, are uh, really, I would say not in any way debatable, they're really essential for mental health and brain health. We try to translate this information again, encouraging people to move from nutrient to food that knowing that zinc is important for your brain is really fascinating. Knowing that omega-3s are really like a, a rare and nutrient, really important. But the most important thing for you as an eater is after this talk is done, you're maybe gonna get yourself a little snack before you go to bed. Or maybe not, maybe you're intermittent fasting. Or, or tomorrow when you wake up, I hope, you're gonna think, looking down at your breakfast plate, hmm. I wonder how this kind of meal is feeding my brain. And it'll translate these important nutrients into the foods that have most of them, because these are the most concentrated sources of some of the most important brain nutrients, things like anchovies and wild salmon. And you can see where those power players I showed you earlier come from. Right? So when we think about top iron foods, moving on the ideas like iron must be like meat or a supplement and think, wow, what about pumpkin seeds? Are those in your vegetable sautés um, or cashews, or if you're eating meat, what about liver, right? And uh, clams, you'll hear me talk about, I'm the only doctor who's ever gonna prescribe you clams. I just want that to be a special part of our relationship. I know no other doctor has ever tried to prescribe you clams. Um, 
uh, yeah, but I'm going to tonight. And and the reason is clams are great with uh, so much iron, but they're also our top source of B12. And then dark chocolate, I'm really just trying to bribe you in all ways to, to get involved with some of the challenges we have going on right now for you to be depression and anxiety. But I love dark chocolate and there's lots of evidence behind it. And let me just take you to Costa Rica because we're on the internets right now. We can go anywhere we want. This is La Anita um, Cacao Rainforest uh, or Cacao Farm in a rainforest in Costa Rica. This is uh, just what happens if you go and uh, eat too much cacao. Just as a warning, you'll end up on it like a zip line with your child wondering like, this is a dangerous, dangerous plant. This is the chocolate flower. I just wanted to show it to you because every little bite of chocolate that you enjoy comes from that tiny little flower and this big fruit and inside that fruit are these juicy kind of sweet, uh, this is, I mean, it's kind of slimy and disgusting and delicious all at the same time. And in there is a cacao bean. If you like cacao nibs, that's what the kind of broken up part. And they take them and they let the bugs from the rainforest come and do a little special dance on them and drop a bunch of bacteria. And then they ferment in these tubs and then you dry them and you get this crispy little cacao bean. And in that are these very special molecules, these flavanols. Now, uh, this is an interesting study. Uh, um, Steve mentioned the fMRI and just all of the technology we now can use. This was a study at Columbia looking at a, a flavanol drink that improved cognition in older adults. I think at that point, that was the only molecule that's really been shown to improve cognition um, by both um, dentate gyrus function and also fMRI. Uh, but as you can see, the hope of this work it isn't to like demonize foods, but it's to get people to swap for a more nutrient density. Not that there can't be hamburgers in your life, but why don't you try the salmon burger and eat to be depression and anxiety? My kids love it and I love feeding kids salmon. Or what about, you know, the chicken burrito? That is a delicious burrito, but what about mixing up having fish tacos or wild salmon tacos? Or, um, uh, you know, trying to get more plants, veggies in some of these foods. I'm gonna run out of time, so we're gonna go kind of quickly here. Again, we talked about fat, and, and again, just thinking where the human brain evolved, if you go back in history, you see that what we called was a grassland is actually a shoreline. And, and in this uh, uh, um, uh, nutritional milieu, you had lots of omega-3 fats, lots and lots of minerality, things like oysters. Oysters are great because they teach about nutrient density, 60 calories in six oysters. And again, look at all of this, nutrition you get. Look at all these nutrients. Things like long-chained omega-3 fats, DHA, EPA, pretty rare in the natural world. You find them in seafood and in algae. And what do those do? Again, uh, just to go from a kind of uh, the brain uh, neuronal membrane here, omega-3 fats, they sit in the membrane. There's some data that maybe they improve both synaptic plasticity, but, but also this idea of uh, there's some science they improve the function of these sodium potassium channels. As a fat, omega-3 uh, DHA can travel into the nucleus and influence uh, BDNF expression at the genetic level. And then because uh, all of our neurotransmitters get wrapped up in these little vesicles, there's evidence that more omega-3 fats in these vesicles can, can be helpful. It leads to this question, what's the perfect fish? Because people are worried about mercury. And, and, and this is kind of my list, but I mainly in our house, we revolve around anchovies, salmon, rainbow trout, and sardines. And people wonder about budget. It's frozen fish is where it's at. Uh, it's great to get fish on sale when it's frozen. Um, this is at the uh, Whole Foods in Manhattan. And so just to show you can, you can feed a family for a nice salmon meal for 10 bucks. This is clam pizza. I'm just going to say that because maybe you hadn't thought about those two words together, but they should go together because pizza is amazing and I love it. And clam pizza is amazing. Um, I, I think it's because clams to me, I have a, a, a lot of vegan friends and I worry about B12. There's a study of, of uh, male vegans and actually 52% of them were frankly B12 deficient. And so this is uh, uh, from my last book, Eat Complete, it's a, a pizza that is a really nice kind of arugula pesto smear and then clams and garlic because a slice of this pizza has 240% of your daily need of vitamin B12. All right, we're gonna cruise through some slides and get to questions. This is my happy place. This is the largest kale field in America. It smells like kale. And this is the first clinical study I ever did. I took very depressed Yale students. I gave them a lot of kale. They, the results speak for this amazing study. Results speak for themselves here, right? 
Now, why do we care about kale and oysters? Just quickly, and how's it related to mental health? Again, for those of you who need a little more science in this, this is how you make those neurotransmitters. If you still love the serotonin, look down here, right? The serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. This is your methylation cycle. This is a, a illustration that my team did back in 2004 to just kind of show how a light oil, you'll see Sam E is used to treat depression now. We understand why B12 is so important to reduce homocysteine, which is correlated with depression. Um, and and uh, uh, again, the folate starts in plants like uh, kale and, and lentils. Um, it, I had a lot of kale shenanigans. That study, EO, yeah, was it true? Just in case, and that was joking. I'm not sure sarcasm, but um, uh, but I, I did do a lot of work with kale and kale taught me something. And I talk about this in my new book about really a conversion from focusing on superfoods to thinking about brain food. And the brain foods seemed to me to follow these three rules. They had nutrient density, like oyster and kales. I could do a lot with them in the kitchen. So they weren't like a pain, you know, and, and, and I didn't get bored of them. And then I liked that they were locally available because I like farmers and I like the idea of supporting our local food cultures. I know there are a lot of people from around the world uh, tuned in. And that's one of the things I just think is such a pleasure for all of us as you go to different areas of the world, there are different foods and different tastes. And, and I think everything that we can do to, support and maintain that is wonderful. A couple of the food categories, we'll get to your questions because again, my new book focuses on food categories. And so nuts and seeds are one that are really uh, important, I think in terms of mental health, because they're a great snack because there's this nice mix of slow burning carb, protein and monounsaturated fats. They've got a lot of interesting nutrients in them like vitamin E. Um, also, I'm huge on beans and lentils. I mean, there's this, I think, kind of strange idea about uh, anti-nutrients in food now that really has no human science to support it and misses the point that when you cook foods, you get rid of those molecules. So why are we talking about that? Let's eat lentil soup. Um, now, not everybody can tolerate these because they have lots and lots of fiber. And so one of the things, if you're starting new to brain foods and more plants, go a little slowly cook things for a long time, but look at all that folate, 90% of your folate in the lentils. So go, uh, uh, probably one of the things on our, I actually had lentil soup this uh, afternoon. This is French onion soup for me complete because I like onions and I like France and I like cheese. And um, I wanted to put that in the book, but it didn't really have enough nutrition in it. So adding in a can of white beans is a really common move in our house. Like we'll make pesto with gnocchi, drop in a can of white beans. We'll make pasta, drop in beans. We really love beans, particularly white beans. Just to... And then um, just quickly, again, a food category to eat are the rainbows. You've all heard that, eat the rainbow. There's a lot of science behind that. That's why I have three different smoothies. You're getting your, all your vitamin uh, A carotenoids. Um, you're getting uh, you know, lots and lots of anthocyanins here in the blues. And these different colors represent different molecules. We call these antioxidants. I think you should call them cell signaling molecules. They're doing a lot. They're communicating to your microbiome. A lot of these have interesting antiviral, antibacterial properties. Actually, the way that anthocyanins work, this is a, we're doing a blueberry challenge on Instagram. You should join up this week. Eat blueberries five to seven times. Magical things happen to your brain this week. Um, and... Anthocyanins, they don't influence the brain by going directly to the brain. They influence the brain through the microbiome, which is just not, we don't have time for that right now, but just one warning, of course, rainbow colors equal those phytonutrients. But being a physician, I do just want you to know that there can be some side effects when you begin to eat too many colorful plants and not enough people in the wellness space are, are talking about this and some of the risks because it's scary the first time it happens. It's like fingers start to vibrate. You feel this weird, feeling in your chest, bam, the rainbow comes right out of your finger. So be prepared and, and do good things with that rainbow. Lastly, your microbiome. All the bugs in your gut, yeah, lots, lots and lots and lots of folks are trying to, uh, you know, uh, sell you probiotics and testing and all this. I have a very simple idea for you. Microbiome diversity relates to the diversity of the plants that you eat and to the amount of fermented foods you eat. And so eating more fermented foods, I think, is also a great way for us to tap into traditional cultures because this is how we always preserved food through fermentation. And so whether it's sauerkraut or, or miso or kimchi or making pickles or drinking kombucha, I, I think fermented foods is a really interesting uh, new way to think about microbiome, not new way, kind of old way to think about microbiome health. I and mean, here's a lovely picture. The idea is that you really, a lot of complexity is happening right here between the stuff you eat 
and the inside of you. And you really want to kind of support this being a very, very healthy, rich um, environment. As I said, there's lots of data about this, how the gut connects to the brain that we won't get into now, but just some of the new science happening in psychiatry is doing things like there's a study looking at patients who had high inflammatory index markers in their blood, you give them a probiotic on admission for mania. Those with a probiotic compared to placebo had a 90% reduction in probiotic in rehospitalization over six months. So we're just seeing again over the last five years a new uh, curiosity and interest in the research, and I think it leads in some ways uh, back to the farm for me. I guess that's what happened in my own life, and um, uh, here I am. Uh, and I guess I hope that around me, there's a set of powerful medicines and that if we think about food as, as a way, a lever that is in our control, something that we can do to improve our, our, our brain health, that if we focus on some of these power players, um, eating more things like uh, pepitas and, and, and uh, more olive oil, more bivalves, I think you can eat to build a better brain. I think you get your brain into brain grow mode. I think you can focus on these big kind of high level concepts, but then have something actionable. Like what do you do for neuro neuroplasticity? Well, something actionable, like what you're eating today, getting more berries, getting more nuts. Um, don't be scared of fish. Remember those clams. And, and the basic take home of the data is traditional diets seem protective for depression, dementia, anxiety, and ADHD. If we learn from history and put the genie back in the bottle, I think we'll do a, a big effort to improve our collective mental health. And I hope from tonight, you, you've had some fun. I hope you feel that you're oriented on the real importance and evidence behind the idea you can feed your mental health. Not that we don't need medications or that we don't need psychotherapy. I've been in analysis for years. I just did 12 hours of psychotherapy in a row today before this talk. I love that stuff. But I also know that there's more we can do in terms of our nutrition to improve our mental health. Join my Brain Food Challenges over the next month. This is uh, my first time getting to collaborate with the University of Texas Dallas Brain uh, uh, Center. And I just wanna thank them um, and thank the sponsors of the talk. Please check out my, actually my new website just went up today. So check it out if you want. And, and most importantly, please, please engage with me on Instagram. That's where my self-esteem is based. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm being kind of, I'm, I'm sort of joking. I'm gonna turn my camera on and answer questions. I think I've run a little long. Um, and I'm sorry about that, but, and I hope you could hear me. I think that the video had to stop. So you missed my wildly waving hands. Um, we do have a few questions. I know we're getting near the top of the hour. We have a ton of great questions, but for those who wanna stick around for just a little bit, I'm going to try to ask three or four of the questions we have made. You can ask three or four, but I really want to say before anyone leaves a super important announcement, which is, and I hope we can flash the QR code up. Your center is involved in really important work about mental health and leveraging data. And if we could just flash up the QR code, I want everybody to scan this code and get involved. As you see, my ability to talk about this with some um, conviction revolves around data and research and supporting research, getting involved in the research. Um, supporting research means a lot more than just donating. It also means being active and supporting these researchers. And I just want to encourage everybody to take a scan of this QR code or take a picture of it and get involved. And I just also want to um, thank the sponsors, Highland Capital and the Container Store for the talk today. And let's answer all your questions. And, anybody, and also you're giving away 10 copies of my book. So um, yep, these are going to be early copies you guys will get. And so please, please, uh, um, again, uh, use that to feed your brain. All right. So let's answer some questions. Great. And I just wanted to make sure that while everybody's awesome. here, everybody uh, gets, um, gets the information. I, I've tried to com combine a few. And by the way, just great content, Drew. Thank you so much. So much for all of us to chew on, pun intended. So um, if you could describe neuroinflammation a little bit better, what exactly is happening there? And how does that impact neuroplasticity and, and other brain function? I think about it like when the fire alarm went off during taking the SAT and I just wasn't gonna do such a good job on those questions. Um, inflammation is our body's natural response to things like stress or an infection or a cut. And it's really essential, but it's like anything in the body, you want it dialed in. Another analogy I use is like, you don't want the SWAT team, like the, the hardcore terrorist negotiator. So you don't want them, those guys directing traffic. 
like in front of the school when like everybody in the SUVs is a little aggro. Like that's not, that's not the right, <laughs> right? We want, so we want to regulate that response. Neuroinflammation looks like it affects circuits of mood. Um, I get into, I interview Roger McIntyre, who's a real expert in this in the book. And he, he and I was shocked how clear he was. He's like Drew, three circuits, they affect mood. They make us hypervigilant and anxious. Um, and they disrupt cognitive circuits. And when I think about what a patient's complain of, excuse me, low mood, anxiety, and a little bit of brain fog. And so not that inflammation's the only cause. And just the last little piece on that, Stephen, is when you look at studies, everyone, you look at these two big meta-analyses that came out about two years ago, when individuals on an antidepressant are given any type of anti-inflammatory, they improve between 70% to 100% better response. So there's some, and many antidepressants like Prozac. Prozac is like ibuprofen for your brain. It's a, it's a central anti-inflammatory. Hmm. And, and so that, those are some of the ways that inflammation can relate to this. And Great. why I think, again, food is an important piece of it. Another set of questions came about supplements, vitamins, nutraceuticals. Where, I mean, if, if you can't always get the fresh foods, does that make sense to go to those supplements? How much do you really absorb? How much of that is really impacting brain health? You know, I think there's so many people that are pushing the supplements. I always feel that my job in the space is really to push food and, and, and talk about the evidence. There's no evidence that a multivitamin is a good insurance policy. Yes, if you are in a, um, a, a situation in your life where you can't get enough food, or I, I had a situation where I had a real gut problem for a while. I was just thankful for that B supplement, just almost for like the relief of anxiety I got, you know, of like, okay, I know I'm getting some B12 in there. Um, is, is, a, a, is a daily piece of, piece of your health, I just don't, you know, it, it, it's kind of, to me, a little bit like faking exercise. But there's no way to do that because yeah. it's the whole thing. And for me, the food, the, other, the last piece about that is supplements, no good night, date night on like a supplement meal, right? It allows people to get this fantasy that, that there's insurance around bad food. Like you can eat garbage with no nutrients and then just take your multivitamin. That is not how it works. And so that's why I get against sort of supplements. And then there's all the toxins that end up in supplements and the expense where I just hear a lot of like, wow, like food's expensive. And it's like, okay, like the $300 of supplements for your brain health is also super expensive. So that's my supplement rant. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, there were also several questions about oils and which oils are best. And I can tell you on my kitchen counter, we have several different types of oil. Let's hear it. Avocado Let's hear oil, it. Coconut. I'm going to do avocado, my thumbs up, coconut, thumbs down. Avocado, coconut, olive. So what, what, what any, any great uh, recommendations on good oils, bad oils, oils that may be good for your brain that may not be. I so want everyone just heart. to listen to Steven. Uh, uh, Grapeseed oil. <laughs> um, grapeseed oil is, I think, one of those oils. Great seeds utility. Great seeds is a high omega six fat oil. Its utility is its high smoke point. Is as far as I understand it in the kitchen, where people like it the way it sort of fries things. I think probably that's would most people would swap out for olive oil. I mean, but frying anything is not great for your brain, but it sure is delicious sometimes. Um, I like uh, um, a little bit of butter just because I think it goes a long, long way. I think for people who are interested in more paleolithic diets and animal fats, it, most folks have never used lard before. Lard is 50% monounsaturated fats, and it's just an interesting thing to cook with occasionally. Um, I would probably recommend, and um, yeah, those are, those are, I would say that the um, olive oil is the main fat we cook with right. and uh, a lot of it. I feel like that's the other way. It's like, are you going through a bottle like this pretty regularly for a family of four or your family or you? And if not, you're not, you're not using enough. Use more. That's good to know. That's good to know. And last but not least, and before we get to the last question, again, thanks to our sponsors, uh, the Container Store, Highland Capital Management. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, Drew, Dr. Ram Ramsey, thanks so much for this great, great material. And look up DrewRamseyMD.com. And trust me, there's some great information there uh, on Dr. Ramsey's website. And last but not least, could you discuss food prep, serving size and preparation mm -hmm. methods? And are there just some do's and quick do's and don'ts there? That's a great question. I just want to thank, thank whoever has asked that question. It's one of the most important things is, is as I said, you know, I wanted you to translate nutrients to food. 
And then in part of the new book, and, and there's a six week plan in the book is really asking eaters, there's a chapter called Eater Heal Thyself, which kind of talks about these types of barriers where maybe you know what to eat and you're having a hard time tapping into your motivation or you're not batch cooking where like, you know, Sunday, just like turn on your favorite tunes, grab some of your favorite veggies, get them sauteed up, make something, you know, a carb you like, some brown rice or some gnocchi or I don't know. And, and maybe, uh, you know, if seafood's a hard thing for you, maybe poach some salmon or make some garlic shrimp or, you know, have some basic components. So with that, and I don't know, a couple taco shells or um, just the, you know, I can quickly always make some brain food. Batch cooking is a huge part of, um, uh, I think, and, and we do a big pesto batch. Actually, in the book, there are some formulas where I encourage people wow. to like, I don't know, maybe your favorite pesto is like a radicchio, pistachio, um, you know, concoction that you haven't yet discovered. Um, find out, make a bunch of that favorite, and have it in your freezer. So yeah, I like batch cooking and prepping as a way to save time, save money. And the other tip I have is I love a slow cooker. I love having a rice cooker. Um, th those are two things that really we do a, a lot with in, in our home kitchen in terms of really saving us time and having something delicious when we come home. So um, great. Great, qu great questions. And cacao pancakes. I just want to say that because it's my favorite Ooh. recipe in the book. Wow. It'll totally change your brain health. And they're amazing. I learned them on that Rainforest Ranch. Um, and, uh, I just, again, thank you, Stephen, And thank you, everyone. Um, uh, sorry that I didn't have a, a lot of time for questions, but I'm super accessible for questions. And so you can, you can uh, ask me on social or, or email us. And, um, again, thank you everybody. Most importantly, I hope you just get the message from a psychiatrist tonight, wherever you are, whoever you are to take care of your mental health and take care of your brain health and take some active steps. There's amazing things that you can do every day to take care of that great human brain you've got. So, so thank you everyone so much. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Thanks to everyone who participated.